Why do people drink? Ugh. Hello, I'm the extremely hungover for a week angry spork, failing to deaden the impact of taking issue with Batman and Robin Eternal. Last issue saw Bruce from seven years back learn the origins of Mother, a woman he thought dead only for his informant to be killed by her after he left. The issue also proved to be a Harper Row love letter with all the subtlety of a tank driving over boxes of bubble-wrapped glass. Issue 22, scripted by Genevieve Valentine, begins at Mother's Fortress in the Arctic Circle, which really makes you wonder about who she contracted to build this place. How many Teamsters died of hypothermia during construction? Never mind that, though, as Mother has completed the task of changing the heading of Spiral Somnus Satellite, where one of her many child slaves, Adam, failed. So he's being dragged away by two others, possibly dead. As she vows not to fail her children, Orphan and Poppy are flying to her location with the chained Harper and Cassandra in tow, cloaked from detection by the Robins in Spiral HQ. Cass tries talking to her fellow captive now that Harper is no longer hipped up on fear gas or ichthys, but she doesn't really want to hear any more apologies for the death of her mom. Naturally, she'd rather be the one talking, recounting how Miranda Rowe used to use the same piece of wrapping paper for multiple gifts over the years. It was one of the many things they did because they didn't have any money, but Harper considered mending clothes or reusing paper to be games. Mama Rowe was proud of how adept Harper was at repairing things, but when she died with no suspects, that's when the girls started acting up, having problems with authority, only getting her act together for her brother's sake. Are they chained together in case of an escape attempt? Because it looks like Harper's end is connected by an easily cut string. Or maybe it's supposed to lob off her head if they try anything, I don't know. Harper knows what Cass went through, but forgiving her is another matter. She doesn't hate her, just feels nothing. And when suggesting that maybe Mother will end up killing her anyway, Mountain Ghost Cassie whispers, Never. Admittedly, the almost painted look of the face actually looks pretty good. But just as knowing and forgiving aren't the same, looking good and being good aren't either. You know, I have had it. I no longer wish to humor the writers of this book, including James Tinney in the fourth, by referring to this character as Cassandra or any variation of that name. She just doesn't strike me as being very much like that character. Her dad never cared about her. Her entire existence is more about drawing more undeserved attention to Harper Rowe, as exemplified by this sudden friendship they just instantly have because reasons and the story demands it. This isn't anything like the mute Batgirl turned Black Bat I want to read about. So henceforth, I am calling her Casino for Cassandra in name only because I won't accept a substandard version of my favorite Batgirl and one of my overall favorite characters. Her dad's not really the same either, so he'll be orphan or... idiot. Robin's past and present are trying to figure out how to stop the usurped satellite, and Grayson is getting worried. His boss, Helena, has gotten a body count from the kids around Spiral's base that were turned murderous, and if Mother can't be stopped from turning everyone under 20 years old into her minions, then she was right all along. Tim is feeling the pressure to outperform a decades planned scheme, and Jason joins in the hopelessness by waiting for someone to blame him for losing Bluebird and her newest spotlight, Casino. See, I told you I would do it. It's as if he just suddenly started caring about them for some reason the writers never bothered to develop. When Agent 37 suggests they've straight up lost like Bats did years back, Damien smacks him. He's appalled that they're using his dad's name and shortcomings as excuses to quit, like Tim at the end of his resources and Jason, the Great Battler, being submissive. Great Battler? Is that because he likes to fight and shoot guns? I mean, I guess in a way it fits, but this is Jason Todd. That title is just too classy for him. Damien then regales them with a the time when Bats was training him in the cave. Damien sacrificed footing for an attack and lost their sparring match as a result. Batman says Jason might have done that at first, but never Dick or Tim, 
which makes the current Robin feel bottom rung, below who he sees as three flawed predecessors. Their type of training isn't going to make him a better soldier for the Dark Knight's cause, but Bruce unmasks as he says he never made or wanted to make any soldiers. Kinda goes against various times he's called his allies as soldiers and his work a war on crime, but hey, what are you gonna do? He continues that Grayson is a clearer vision of what Batman could be, Tim is a great strategist, and, well, here's what gets me. He says Jason is willing to do what Batman can't when the world needs it. Basically kill people, likely with guns. And this has long been my problem with this post-Flashpoint Batman. He's suddenly okay with someone he trained to avoid those actions doing the opposite. For whatever reason, I can't really find one that makes any sense. This isn't like working alongside Jim Gordon, who, as a cop, is trained to discern when is and is not the right time for a lethal force. And Jason Todd has not been at all shown to have that kind of sensibility. He revels in bad decisions and the opportunity to kill his enemies. If that's the direction they want to take this particular version of the character, fine. But Batman and his allies, like Tim Drake and Dick Grayson, would not and should not approve, much less praise him for it. He's all about finding better, non-lethal solutions, yet here he is talking like Red Hood will someday save the world? Bull! The only reason I found that Jason Todd gets special exception from the no-killing rule is Bruce feeling bad about his death at the hands of the Joker, which is complete nonsense. When food left for him goes cold and needs to be thrown out, does Alfred get to go torch some fast food restaurants? Damien would attain the necessary skills with or without his dad, but Bruce wants him to decide for himself what sort of man he'll become. He wants him, and those that came before, to make their own choices, with Bruce catching them until those decisions are made. This sounds extra flowery when you ignore the fact that decisions have equal chance of being good, like taking a character on a new journey, a new adventure to get inside their head, give them an arc to experience, or horribly, horrendously, stupidly bad, like reinventing Kelsey Kane! In the present, the young Wayne says his father's distance and uncertainty isn't a lack of faith in his protégés, as he wanted them all to surpass him and likely believed in their ability to stop Mother. With that arousing motivation, Grayson has Red Hood check for any contacts that can track Black Ops airspace, while Tim looks for high-density populations for the highest impact from Ichthys, while monitoring for satellites moving into position. They'll show Mother what a bunch of not-soldiers can do as all Robins face the reader, with Grayson declaring if this'll be their last move, they'll forfeit some footing for an attack because doing something I'm usually too smart to do may throw Mother off and help us win the day instead of getting us killed, which is the same reason I'm going to stick a butter knife into a light socket. Mother is busy talking to herself, musing on Grayson trying to track her and again bemoaning his unforgivably wasted potential. Idiot walks in with Casino and Harper in tow, though less chained up. Though it's unbecoming, he offers the girls as an apology gift, and when Harper mouths off about his other unbecoming traits, Mother tells her to be silent. Eh, maybe the old dame's not so bad after all. Orphan kneels before his boss, profusely apologizing for his failures, saying it was all in her name and he suffered being away from her. Unsurprisingly, she cuts his throat using the pin of her cloak, saying he never understood that suffering was endless. Instead of becoming stronger, he feared it, and that's why he is tossed in the icy arctic waters through a trap door with a picture of the globe on it. What, did Mother get that at a discount from a James Bond villain? So the villainous father of a crime-fighting teenage heroine has his throat cut by a treacherous mastermind that was using them the whole time. Someone on this book seems to have daddy issues, and it really doesn't help the story. Also note that Orphan is at the opposite end of the chain holding Harper and Casino, 
a chain that pulls the ladder down as he falls. After that, the door closes and it looks like there's zero gap from the chain. And Casino is up again like there's no tether at all. Like it just disappeared. But if the writers and editors didn't think about this, why should we, right? Mama Nanners then starts addressing Casino, claiming she was too weak and feeble an old woman to put a stop to Orphan years ago, and liked being needed. Turns out, Mother has a lot more orphans where Idiot came from, and as she toasts to an impending world remade by her, she activates Ichthys, as the issue closes on a busy metropolitan street. To be honest, I feel like this whole world domination angle is kind of coming out of left field. I suppose it is sort of a natural progression of her overall ambition, but I think what hurt it is that the book has been just too busy with awful character reinventions and pampering Harper Rowe. Valentine's still on script for issue 23, which opens to several panels, each set in a different part of the world as children succumb to Ichthys. Captions relate a message from Harper to her brother Cullen, and it must have been a while ago since she hasn't called him since a week before the voicemail, and she mentions going to look for Casino, whom Cullen doesn't know as far as we've seen. Harp tells him in spoiler alert to avoid doing anything dumb, knowing Cullen can take care of himself. A two-page spread sees kids across the globe pick up instruments of destruction, gather in groups to assault people, and... Is that little girl bending a lamppost? Since when did this mind control program give super strength? Anyway, it's six minutes into the worldwide chaos, conveniently on TV for Colin to watch, with a baseball bat nearby. We also see another example of the issue title harkening back to a previous DC storyline, because they're really out of ideas. That's when Spoiler Alert walks in, suited up except her mask because she apparently doesn't know how to use it, and declares her intentions to head out and fight children. Wow, going out without Harper Rose permission? Isn't she so rebellious? If Ichthys affects everyone under the age of 20, why aren't they feeling it? There's obviously a signal going on in Gotham, so do they just happen to be out of range? She tells Cullen to head to the roof, where Bat Folk would be more likely to rescue him, but he'd rather be of use to the situation. That's when Red Robin drops in from a Sherbert Swirl portal from the ceiling, appraising them of the matters at hand. With another portal opening behind him, he tells Spoiler Alert she'll be guarding Scarecrow, whom Spiral pulled strings to let a cape get close to. Cullen wants to go along and isn't taking no for an answer, so he'll meet the operator of the funky portals. As children elsewhere in Gotham hoard together chanting, Mother! The Bat allies are gathered through portals in the apartment of the Midnighter, who is suddenly in this story because his portals are convenient to the plot and shut up. They confirm cooperation from the likes of Katana, Black Canary, who wanted it known she personally doesn't like Red Hood, so points to Dinah Lance, Batwoman, and others as Nighter excuses some guy named John and greets Cullen, who in turn introduces himself as Harper's brother because that's his sole defining trait, saying they have to find her. As he accesses his workstation, Midnighter says, No idea who that is, but I suspect that's why they're here. <gasps> he doesn't know who Harper Rowe is? Then why is he in this comic? How effective can he be to the story if he's not aware of just how perfect and vital she is to the DC Universe? As Red Hood starts handing out weapons in the background, Seriously, Jason, those aren't yours. Batgirl and Red Rob manage to find Somnus, and there are 12 cities affected in a 12-mile radius from towers acting as transmitters. They're shielded, so they can't portal directly to them, and there's one receiver scrambling airspace and grounding planes in the satellite's wake. Midnighter will stay on ops while the Allies go to each site and fight through Mother's children protecting the towers. Grayson, meanwhile, is heading straight for the old crone herself, now discovered, conveniently, in the Arctic though he'll have to wait 32 minutes for an opening. And if, as Red Hood ponders, they can't stop the signal, Agent 37 teases an alternative, and that's when we jump to SPOILER ALERT guarding Jonathan Crane. With her mask down. Why? 
is this character so blasted stupid she can't keep her mask on? She takes it off at every opportunity, gloating to her dad while he's in a room with security cameras in it. When she meets a complete stranger she happens to think is cute. And now in front of a super villain! Stephanie Brown was never a super genius, but she was never as completely incompetent and utterly stupid as spoiler alert here. She's practicing with Eskrima sticks, mimicking moves from a training video Grayson linked to her. Win! While Crane tries getting into her head, saying how much lesser she is than the Batman's other allies that don't trust her. But she knows she's being played on her insecurities like half the guys in town, whatever that means, and that he wants her to be ashamed of her fear. Scarecrow thinks her defiance will make her more rewarding to break, but spoiler alert sensei taught her when to draw the line with the likes of him. What sensei? And you're not in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Put your mask on! A portal opens above Crane and Red Hood yoinks him to his old chemical plant, where he'll make trauma toxin for every kid on the planet so as to keep clear of Mother. After all, Crane is a loose end and she doesn't like those. Though that raises the question, since she somehow survived cyanide poisoning and knows Crane's deception for Batman, why is Strawface still alive? That aside, he can avoid a world of fearless children and outsmart the woman where Batman failed, or Hood will give Blondie McMoron a gun. Back at Midnighters, Grayson is coordinating with the other allies, saying the doors are a one-way trip, and confirming they're all green and wishing them luck. He'll have to be ready himself, since he's got a journey ahead of him, and the door can't get him very close. A two-page spread sees the likes of Damien, Catwoman, Red Robin, and even a free agent like Duke Thomas high above various armies of kids. And once again, we have a character that should be affected by Ichthys, but for some reason isn't. You know, when it comes to any interesting or possibly good elements to these story points, this book continues to remain inconsistent. I guess it's saving all its consistency for Harper Row worship and continually bad ideas. As the scattered battles begin, Cullen is bringing coffee and suggests getting a better feed in Sydney from local CCTV feeds. Midnighter offers to let him try the technique himself, but the teenager is reluctant since he's only ever hacked their electric bill. Constantly giving Harper Rowe convenient skills is bad writing. Giving a skill to her brother in such convenience is still bad writing. I mean, right out of the blue, we're suddenly told he has hacking proficiency. How? When? Is it because he breathes the same air as Harper? I mean, wait. I guess he would either have to have hacked the bill to be lower or completely paid off, which I guess means that Harper's job at Gotham Electric doesn't pay very well. Oh, you didn't know that Harper had a job? Not surprising, given that hints all these issues of the Eternal books that so prominently feature Harper, she's never once seen at her place of employment. But Colin takes him up on his offer while he makes contact with Grayson in the Arctic, reaffirming that going in, satellites and portals are no longer viable, and he'll be all alone. Agent 37 is well aware, mounting a snowmobile and, after an hour of worldwide anarchy, heads off towards the icy fortress. The ironic thing about Mother's hideout? The ice machine is broken. Also, that everything screwed text in the corner is so very indicative of this series. And DC. And the chance of reading a worthwhile version of Cassandra Kane ever again. Issue 24, Steve Orlando scripting, is the first to keep the subtitle on one page where Dick has arrived at the enemy's doorstep, radioed from his allies that things are not going so great. Funny that his comms work so close to the evil air, figured those would be scrambled or something. Well, all the allies can do is hold on, and as we see, it includes Spiral Agents, Talon, and Bat Gordon fighting alongside Duke Thomas. Though it makes me wonder if Duke and Jim are coordinating with Midnighter as well, 
Doesn't look like it, though. Speaking of, Niter is suited up and using a hollow interface all of a sudden. Okay. Red R gets creative with the portal doors to build up enough momentum to reach the top of the receiver in Moscow. Could you feel how cool I am to the comms? Oh, good. Because between Harper Row, Damien, and Harper Row, there wasn't enough arrogance in this comic. And there's a reason I mentioned Row twice. Hood gets creative too, but to injure a child while bragging to Midnighter, who's back to using physical keyboards. Okay. Also, he insinuates he'd remove the kid's kneecaps. Because it's fun to threaten children. Cullen brings him a sandwich, because with Alfred a no-show, someone's got to be the butler, I suppose. He's wondering if his sister is okay, and that's when we jump to a lavish bedroom in Mother's base, where she's in her costume, which she hasn't actually worn in quite a while. She was in civilian clothes when she was abducted, so... Characters having their clothes change for them while they sleep. Another element repeated from Batman Eternal. A creepy, creepy element. Mother is present, offering Coco, but Harper demands to know where Casino is. The woman draws her attention to hollow screens activated around her, showing the bat allies struggling against the children made in the monsters. Horrific but necessary, the old bag claims, then summarizes her origin from issue 21 in a few bubbles, thinking she needs to save the entire planet from the same fate as her village. She goes on that Batman chose to deny her a happy, more fulfilled life. Handed her mask, she's told she can still become as incredible as she was meant to be by cutting ties and taking power instead of waiting for it to be given. The fact that Mother is saying this to Harper Rowe, who has been given pretty much everything at any given time, is such grand hypocrisy. Or... Irony. Or both. Hypocrisy. I don't know. Stupid either way. Outside, the ground beneath Grayson shakes, revealing a runway for a dozen crafts to fly out, and he radios to his allies just before a plane crashes nearby. And from the wreckage emerges Azrael, eager to have a violent and very likely fiery chat with Mother. Agent 37 disagrees, saying the slaver should be held accountable for all to see. Speaking of, she continues pontificating on her plans to row, has operations seal the upper chambers in what looks like a controlled avalanche, and admits she found time to indulge in the old ways, as she projects holograms of her artisanal killers, apparently molded by the same means as Idiot, and not the more modern Ichthys. Normally, you gotta drive a good 20 miles out of the city to get a good artisanal killer. Them big-name grocery stores just slap artisanal on any murderer they got, just to charge you extra. And I can't be the only one seeing the blatant hypocrisy here, given that Mother was all upset at Orphan for raising a child in the old ways, and she berated him about how they needed to move forward and improve. Anyway, as the allies discover, those crafts contain the other orphans, which immediately enter the many frays. Things are headed south, according to the computer in Midnighter's head, and he needs to leave his station in Cullen's hands, assuring he's as strong as the sister that he previously said he doesn't know. Guess that computer brain calculated the writer's convenience will be strong with him, too. Nighter takes over Crane Watch and has spoiler alert hold the line in Tokyo, like they talked about, that we never saw. She's eager for the chance, since it makes so much more sense for the one with the least amount of fighting experience to head into battle with super killers, and does a flying kick through the portal into the back of an orphan. The killer taunts her, admitted she's trained some, but isn't as strong, but the Flashpoint clone leg locks and flips over her foe. And here we have the return of yet another tradition in the Eternal Books. This time, it's convenient and ambiguous training that works out for a character for the situation at hand. Back in the Arctic, Mother tells Bluebird that her family and her city have left her weak, as evidenced by leaving her mom's killer alive. She has a chance to remedy that as a straight jacket bound casino is lowered from the ceiling. 
Harper makes a valid point that the girl was acting on Mother's order, but the crone says it was only to give Ro the better life she deserved. And this lady is a master manipulator? Anyway, Mother gives Harper a blade, encouraging her to cut ties. I am so convinced that Harper's gonna go through with this. I mean, they spent so much time establishing through visual flashbacks how much Harper loved her mom and detailed the struggles she went through outside a few bits of dialogue peppered throughout the story. Oh wait, they didn't do any of that, so this situation has all the tension and suspense of waiting for dry paint to get drier! Tune in next time to catch the obvious decisions to be made.